President. Senator from Virginia. Mr. President, I also rise and thank my colleague from Wisconsin and also my colleague from Vermont. Their words have been very powerful, and I also rise to talk about health care. We are told in the Senate that tomorrow we vote, but we don't know what we'll be voting on. We will bring up a House bill that by virtually every account is not going to be the bill that we'll be voting on. But we don't yet know which version of health care we will be voting on if we proceed to the debate. It's like a three-card money game. There's all sorts of different versions that are out there on the table. One version would take health insurance away from 22 million people, one 25 million, one 32 million, and we're not being told which one we'll vote on. When I was a kid, there was a TV show that we used to watch, Let's Make a Deal, and one of the features of the show was this, what's behind door number one and what's behind door number two? And the contestants would have the opportunity to pick. One would be great, one would be a disaster, and that was the fun of the game show. What's behind door number one? What's behind door number two? But this isn't about a game show. We're not participating in a game show. We're participating in a decision about the most important aspect of any person's life, their health. About the most important expenditure that they ever make with a dollar, a health care expenditure. And about the largest sector of the American economy, health care. And instead of treating the issue with the gravity it deserves, there's a secret plan and a mystery vote without any hearings, shutting out the committees, including the health committee where I serve, shutting out the minority party that represents 48 of the 100 senators in this body, and most importantly, shutting out the public. As the senator from Vermont mentioned, in this body, the greatest deliberative body in the world, we have not had a single hearing, we have not heard from a single doctor, a single patient, a single hospital, a single nurse, a single insurance company, a single medical innovator, we are about to take a vote on the most important expenditure in anyone's life and the largest sector in the American economy following a completely pro closed process where it has been the will of the majority to keep the door shut. This isn't a game show. Mr. President, let me tell you how real this is how real this is. I did something on Friday that I often do. I started doing this in 2002. I live in Richmond, but I drive a number of hours to Wise County, Virginia, which is a county on the border between Virginia and Kentucky. And it's a county where my wife's family is from. She grew up in Roanoke, but her dad is from Big Stone Gap, VA, in Wise County, right across the border from Pike and Hazard counties in Kentucky. There's a fairgrounds in Wise, the Virginia-Kentucky Fairgrounds, and back in the late 1990s, a Catholic nun, Sister Bernie, and two other wonderful nurses who have become friends, Teresa and Paula, they decided to try to offer health care for people who didn't have health insurance at this county fairgrounds. And they just set up with a few volunteers, and they said, you live in Appalachia if you don't have health insurance, if you need medical care, dental care, just come and we'll see what we can do. And they do this every week, every July, one weekend a year. Here's what this has grown into. I first went when I was lieutenant governor in 2002. People start to arrive, and I've talked about this on the floor, but I just did it Friday, and I want to share some stories. They start to arrive Tuesday or Wednesday in cars, and they camp in the campground. Now, it's July. This weekend was the hottest weekend in the summer. They, they start camping with their kids, often in cars, some are sleeping in cars, some are throwing blankets out on the lawn next to a chain link fence, and they wait in the tens, in the dozens, in the fifties, in the hundreds, and then they open the door at 6 a.m. Friday morning, and the people who've waited for days come in and get a number to see if they can get health care on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday from volunteer doctors in the richest nation and the most compassionate nation in the world. When they opened the door Friday morning, I was down there and I was starting to, I do what I do. I go and I work the registration booth and I talk to people and register them so they can get health care. I got there a little late. They'd open the door at 6. I got there at 8 a.m. 
And they'd already given out numbers to 1,200 people in the first two hours. And over the course of the weekend, they served thousands of people. And they come in to get dental care, and most of them, their teeth are too far gone, so it's just a matter of pulling their teeth. They come in some to have most of their teeth pulled and they can get dentures. They get an eye exam and find out, wow, I should have gotten glasses five or ten years ago. No wonder I've been such a poor student all the way through school or no wonder I've had such a hard time on my job. I needed glasses. They get cancer screening and sometimes they get something caught early and sometimes they get something caught very late. It's, it's an amazing spectacle. It is it is uplifting because of the volunteers who turn out, doctors, dental hygienists, nurses, the Lions Club that comes to do vision screening. That's uplifting, but it's depressing. It's heartbreaking to see people sleeping up against chain link fences and, and sleeping crunched over in their car for days so that they can get a little bit of free health care in the richest nation on earth. When I work the registration booth, I have to ask people a series of questions so that they know who that they can go to see as they're there. And I work the booth for about an hour and a half. Here's a question you ask everybody. How long has it been since you've seen a doctor? How long has it been since you've seen a doctor? I had a, I had a mother of four kids, and the kids are like 12 and under, and they're sort of buzzing around, and the mom is sitting in the chair. And you know what happens if you're a mom with kids that young. Your kids pick up something at school, they bring it home, and you get sick. This is what happens to parents. I've got a colleague here with young kids, and he knows what I'm talking about. And I asked the mother, how long has it been since you've seen a doctor? I'm not really sure. So I was kind of going through my checklist. Seen a doctor within the last year? No, not within the last year. Seen a doctor within the last two years? Not within the last two years. Seen a doctor within the last three years? I might have seen a doctor in the last three years, a mother of four young kids. I had somebody sitting across me. I asked her another common question. Are you employed? You ask everybody this, part-time, full-time. I'm not employed, but I'm about to get my nursing license back. Well, that's interesting. So you're a healthcare professional. Well, I used to be. About to get my nursing license back. Well, what happened? Now, this wasn't on the questionnaire, but I couldn't resist asking her, what happened? Well, I was a nurse. I had a great career. I had a great life. But then a doctor prescribed me opioids for arthritis, and the bottom fell out of my life. I got, I got addicted to opioids, and I lost my license, and I lost virtually everything in my life, and now I'm unemployed, but I'm working as a counselor at a church trying to help people who are also opioid addicted, and I'm about to get my license back, but I don't, I, I'm not working yet, and I don't have insurance yet, and that's why even though I'm a nurse and I'm a healthcare professional, I've waited in line for a couple of days to come get health care. There was a, a woman from Maryland who had been laid off as a supervisor at McDonald's a number of months ago. She was unemployed. She had horrible dental problems that were way past being solved. She just needed to get a bunch of her teeth pulled to ease her pain. So get what this woman did. This is about an eight or nine hour drive from her house. When her teeth got so bad and so painful after her firing and she needed to have her teeth pulled, she couldn't go anywhere. She didn't have anybody to do it. She said, I think there's this free clinic in Appalachia. Now, it's a couple months, after, so I'm going to have to suffer through the pain for a while, but I also have to save up some money. She saved up her money like most people would try to save money for a summer vacation. She saved up her money so that she could put enough gas in the car and pay for one night at a hotel so she could drive for nine hours to Wise County, Virginia, and wait in a line for days and come and get a bunch of her teeth pulled in the richest and most compassionate nation on earth. And finally, I had another guy, and I asked him the question you ask, what are you here for? Are you here for medical services? Are you here for dental services? Are you here for vision services? And he said, well, I'm actually here for all three, but the problem is it's the hottest day of the year. It, it, it's 95 and humid, and I can't sit out in the sun. I'm so sick, I can't sit out in the sun all day, so I've got to do two out of three. I can't do all three. Well, I said, well, which are the two worst? Is it the medical and the dental, or is it the vision and the dental, or the vision and the medical? He said, look, I'll do dental and I'll do medical, but I, even though I, I've got glasses and I need to get an upgrade, I can't wait around because I'm so sick out in the hot sun for so long, so you're just going to have to give me the two out of the three. I can't wait all weekend. I can't wait all day. 
in this dusty fairground on the 21st of July to get health care. These people need us. They need us to be at our best. They need us to be thinking about them. The first time I went to this clinic in Wise, I was struck by the magnanimity of the volunteers. I was struck by the magnitude of the need. But the thing that really hit me was when I went in the parking lot, and I expected to see cars from Virginia and Kentucky. Kentucky's 10 miles away from this fairground. And I might have expected to see cars from West Virginia. It's 100 miles away. Or Tennessee is 40 miles away, but North Carolina is 150 miles away, and South Carolina is 350 miles away, and Georgia is 400 miles away, and Alabama is farther, and Oklahoma is farther, and people drive from all over the southeast United States in the richest nation on earth, in the most compassionate nation on earth, to wait for days in a dusty campground in the heat of the hottest part of the summer so that they can have their teeth pulled because they don't have health care. The Affordable Care Act has cut the uninsurance rate to one of the lowest in recorded history, but we haven't gone far enough. We've got to do better by these people who are sleeping in their cars or up against chain link fences who are traveling for nine hours to get their teeth pulled. Not worse. We want to have fewer people like this and fewer folks who need to do this, not more. And the vote that we're going to have about whether it's 22 million or 25 million or 32 million people who lose health insurance... That's going the wrong way. We've got to go a different way. We've got to do better, not worse. Most of the things we talk about in this chamber, they are about issues. This isn't about issues. This is about who we are. This is about who we are as senators. This is about who we are as Americans. This is about who we are as thinking, feeling, breathing, believing human beings. It's about who we are. A great teacher, a great teacher once laid out the yardstick. I was sick and you took care of me. That's one version of the New Testament. There's other phraseologies from the 25th chapter of Matthew. I was sick and you visited me. I was sick and you cared for me. I was sick and you looked after me. The teacher basically says... The way you treat someone who is sick is the way you treat the creator. It's important to be compassionate to somebody who's sick. And anybody who's hearing these words, you don't have to think for a second to think about somebody in your family who is suffering from cancer or dementia or mental illness or who's been the victim of an accident There are faces appearing in your minds right now because we all have this in our family. The way we treat people who are sick is not just a measure of us. It's a measure of what we think about the creator. When a great teacher said, I was sick and you took care of me, he was giving an instruction to us about the way we should behave. In the last weeks, I'm struck by The fact that this body has been jolted by the news about two of our colleagues, both of whom who have had cancer diagnoses. Last week, we were shocked and saddened to hear about our colleague from Arizona, Senator McCain, who was my chairman on the Armed Services Committee, who was suffering a very tough form of cancer, and cancer is going to find a match in a Senator McCain. This touches us in this body. A week or two before, we heard about another colleague on the Armed Services Committee who sits next to me at every committee hearing, Senator Hirono, who announced she had kidney cancer and just underwent surgery. And I was chatting with her on the floor earlier tonight. I don't think she would mind me saying it. She's a strong, she's a fighter, just like Senator McCain's a fighter, but she's worried about it, just like Senator McCain would be. This touches everyone. It touches the powerful, it touches the powerless. It touches the wealthy, it touches the poor. It touches men, it touches women. It touches the young, it touches the old. It touches everyone. And the way we treat people who are sick, the way we treat people who are anxious about their health is the way we treat the creator. That's what we are taught. So let's live up to that standard. Why would we do otherwise? 
Why are we here? Why did we run? Why do we serve? What do people expect of us? I was sick and you cared for me. I was sick and you visited me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was sick and you took care of me. Is it that hard? Is it so important to rush it through and not have hearings and not have committees and not engage the Democrats and not listen to the people sleeping against chain link fences or driving nine hours to get their teeth pulled? We can't afford to get this wrong. And the talent of the people in this body convinces me beyond a shadow of a doubt that if we take the time, we can get this right. And if we can get this right, why won't we take the time to get this right? So I would plead with my colleagues, let's stand together on behalf of the sick. Let's stand together on behalf of those who are counting on us. Another part of the New Testament is the letter of Paul to the Hebrews. Because we are, sound, because we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we've got to do the right thing. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who want us to do the right thing. And I know we can, and I pray that we will. And with that, Mr. President, I yield the floor.